Good morning. Oh, God. So uh, when I wake up early in the morning after a long evening of drinking iced tea, this is what my voice sounds like. <laughs> so I hope you guys had a pleasant evening yesterday. So the agent, agent 327, um, many, many different topics to talk about. It's, uh, it's fairly successful. It's reaching almost 3 million on YouTube, so it's you know, pretty good. Um, but yes, yes, yay. So there's so many different topics I can kind of dive into, but I wanted to dive a little bit into the animation style because uh, just a little bit about like what were the choices made and then like what did I at least learn from that experience. So um, this, you know, to me is still kind of interesting. This is uh, the, the 2014 test that I animated and then another shot that I animated uh, two years later when we actually did the short film. So it was, it was like a proof of a proof of proof of concept, the top one, and then the bottom one is a proof of concept for a feature film. All right. Um, it's different, right? Like, it's a different style. And in some alternative universe, we did the short film in the style of the top one, of course. Uh, but I'm actually really pleased that we didn't do that. We could have done it, and it would have been wacky and fun, but there's something very different about the style, like the path we went down. It's bit more real, you know, which you would think, oh, that's a little bit more boring. But there's a reason for it. Like, it's because um, the emphasis was on trying to get some empathy going on with a cartoon character and having, you know, any, anything, any danger happening, it would have consequences. So if somebody gets hit, you actually see the bruising and you feel like, you know, this person is in danger. Uh, and you kind of don't get that as much when you have something like the style above. You know, there's something wacky happens and he gets hit, but it's kind of like Tom and Jerry sometimes. You, you just don't get that empathy. So it's, it was kind of an interesting experiment. Of course, uh, click, there we go. A lot of things needed to happen in order to get where we ended up being. Uh, a lot of experiments. Of course, you have to do the walk cycles and you've got to try out the different characters. Uh, interesting enough, uh, this is an earlier version of you know, what they actually look like and, and felt like. And you see the barber has a distinct different personality. So within the beginning of the production, we actually just completely changed his personality. He's supposed to be this kind of posh, snobby guy. Uh, miss him. I still miss him a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some experiments, you know, uh, that's a beautiful Nerf gun there that I'm carrying. Uh, this is this was for Annecy, so we're doing some experiments with like the snappiness of it, uh, how fast it would travel, like you know, when you act out things, how, how broad do you do the different uh, posing. There's also just getting that appeal. I mean, uh, I think Andy's going to dive a little bit more into the character design, but even then, like once you have the character design, and it's roughly where you need it to be. Even the animator, though, needs to take it to that extra level. So as an example, we have just kind of the same smile, but in uh, you know, one side, the right one, it's a little bit more asymmetrical. And that's just me tweaking with a lot of different bones, just kind of getting that asymmetry in there. And you know, kind of see the difference. So it's, it's giving you, it's invoking the same feeling, this uh, roughly the same kind of relaxed smile, but it's just, a little bit more appealing. And then, of course, you've got to do model sheets and you've got to do that stuff. I think, in hindsight now, when I look at it, we should, should have spent a little bit more time on that, even more than like the time I spent on this. We did it for all the different characters, but even then, uh, I think there's much to be learned about doing these things and exactly what expressions need to be done and from what angle. Uh, because it really helps later on when you're doing the animation that every, uh, the character feels like it's the same character from one shot to another, especially when you're transitioning from a 2D character to a 3D character. Uh, there were some uh, interesting uh, behind the scene, you know, little shots that we had. It's very fun. Poor, poor Nathan. Uh, but it's, it's, it's been like a long journey of, of uh, figuring out what exactly is that style and you know, that tangibility of it. And you can see the kind of the long evolution of it. Many, in many cases, like you go down a road and you realize, no, that's too far in one direction or the other. So you kind of back up and you try something else. So there's a lot of experimentation going on. Um, 
but I think we never like back down from the fundamentals of having it have consequences and feeling like every punch matters. So that means that it, it feels more like an action movie or action short film or whatever, rather than just kind of the zany, cartoony thing. And that's something we haven't really seen a lot. Like, I don't, I, I've never seen that in the industry before. So it was kind of an interesting thing. Um, next up is Andy, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, We're doing that. Hey. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, the look development process uh, on this project. Um, uh, not so much about character design, but also uh, just on a pure uh, uh, artistic point of view on how we uh, designed shots. Because, I mean, in a movie, you're, you're kind of the smallest entity are frames, and then we, the, like, the bigger one sequences. But really, a shot is like the thing that you're, more, uh, uh, you're working on uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about the things that kind of uh, generally that uh, I learned in this whole process. And I think the, those things are really valuable to keep in mind. And some are uh, obvious. Um, and now in hindsight, I'm thinking like, oh, why didn't I think of that? But it's all like, it's a real uh, collaborative process, really. Um, so yeah, uh, look development. Um, we also call this, what is it phase? Um, <laughs> and uh, th this kind of became a catchphrase in the studio because at some point people just were staring at the screen and like asking, ripping their hair out. And, why? What's wrong with this? Uh, so, yeah, um, most of the things that uh, I want to talk about is, like, like I said, is a collaborative process. So um, everyone had their input into uh, into these things, and uh, I think it's great at the end of a project to kind of sum them up. So. Uh, um, I think most instrumental uh, in, in, in this process were uh, uh, Hjartan, I mean Hjalti, uh, for like <laughs> when it comes to animation and everything, but, uh, but also Hjartan uh, and Colin in terms of just how we build the shot, how we make sure that the viewer's attention is in all the right places. So um, uh, in, the, in the beginning, like uh, there were some things that, uh, that, that were really unclear, so uh, we tried to focus on uh, the things that, that really didn't work so much. So these are like, uh, I think right now, uh, here is an example of what we were at uh, right before the conference last year when we last talked to you guys. And uh, like we just were out of the character modeling phase. We kind of had the characters there, but not quite. And uh, we completely neglected the environment. So uh, of course, for, a whole, for the whole shot design to work, you, you need uh, the, the environment, but also you need the, the layout. And uh, layout just started at that point. I think Colin just came in, and then uh, uh, Hjalti and him, they sat together and kind of really polished and uh, nailed down the layout, even through the animation phase. So there were just like these bare bone uh, shots there. Like, this is not even a shot from the film. Um, this is also not a shot from the film. This is just a test, and but but these things already were great, uh, you know, great grounds to talk about certain aspects of how this film could work or how it couldn't work. And uh, there are some things that uh, that are just uh, a bit weird because, like, we had this problem problem in the beginning that uh, the characters were very cartoony. Uh, we we were still fine, trying to find the animation style, and, you know, grounding them in reality, making making it possible for you, for you to relate to them. Um, and the environment was, was always kind of too realistic, but we couldn't nail, nail it down to exactly what was the thing that made it too realistic. So uh, lots of tests. Like that was uh, one of the earliest uh, tests uh, of the agent coming into the barbershops. And then uh, barbershop, and of course, uh, nothing is done in this shot, so there's lots of work in progress things, and not all the props were there. Um, uh, anyway, there were some things that uh, magically worked. So, for example, there was like the, the earlier instance of this shot here that uh, I think, yeah, the, the personality of the barber changed. Um, 
uh, but but somehow this shot really uh, like struck us as a thing that uh, it kind of works. It's uh, everything is is really nice. Like the uh, the characters like the characters look like like that thing, you know. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> also, this shot uh, uh, of the barber. I think this was a, a later version of the shot, but uh, there was also one where the barber was more, you know, less uh, zombie-ish uh, with his scar. But but also, this shot kind of kind of worked. Um, so yeah, to just dissect the things that we learned and, and uh, with these few examples and uh, uh, how we uh, applied them over the whole movie. That's the that's the things I'm going to talk about. So it's all, all just a loose sort of arrangement of things. So uh, I'm going to start with the most obvious. So uh, props have to fit into the character's hands. Uh, that's I mean that that's really obvious from a point of view as where, like when you're making the props, the characters have to have to handle them. Uh, most obvious example is of course the agent's gun. Uh, he has these huge shovely hands and of course we can't have uh, a realistically proportioned gun and, and have it fit into his hands. It doesn't work. Um, um, and of course other things that the characters interact with. But uh, the, the not so obvious thing, especially when you're working on, on a bigger team where other people are, uh, where m some people are working on the main props and other people are working on the background props, uh, it's not so obvious that, that these things, of course, also apply to the background objects because um, that's uh, hugely important for making the whole world kind of fit together and gluing everything together, making that style work, uh, making sure that the style works. Uh, here's an example that that was a test with uh, the the dressing tables in the barber shop, which was modeled after a real dressing table in uh, in the actual barber shop that served as a template for this movie. Um, here it was a test where we just tried to make the shapes a bit broader. We tried to thicken the knobs uh, on on the on the drawers drawers, and we see that it kind of uh, gets into a, a better place. You can also see the different uh, texture. Um, we try to uh, make sure that the textures are not so realistic that the contrast is slightly uh, less pronounced. Um, and of course, you can bring it to an to the extreme where uh, <laughs> you kind of cartoonify everything. <laughs> so we have to kind of find the right uh, the right balance of making it cartoony, making it believable. Um, so yeah, another example is for, for uh, the the ice cream truck. Um, this was modeled after a real uh, Citroën uh, H uh, bus, and uh, even though the the, uh, the surfaces are really uh, kind of realistic, uh, we try to um, we try to simplify some shapes and some aspects. We try to take uh, less of the details, like on the grill, there's uh, less of the stripy uh, intersection things, and uh, we try to kind of over. Overall, like keep the idea of the same of the bus, but just take a few things out that that just make it too realistic, and remove the details that are too small. Um, another one, uh, using visual clutter to our advantage. Uh, uh, we had uh, this test here very early on, which uh, the the barber shop was still a work in progress and. Uh, we were doing so many things that we didn't have time to to do all the picture frames uh, on the wall, and uh, those were kind of crucial because in all our uh, design uh, examples, we we had uh, pictures of those barber shops that kind of have these huge walls covered in in, in pictures and strange uh, strange objects and so on. So we never quite uh, in in the early phase got to that point where where we had enough material to put on the walls. So when we were uh, putting these shots together, we kind of asked ourselves, so what is wrong here? Um, I mean, there are some things missing, but, but how, many, how many picture frames do we actually put in that place? And, and of course, there's things like there's, uh, the, there's the patterns are too regular all over the place. It's it, on, on a design point of view, um, there are some areas that your eye just get attracted to because there is repeating patterns and parallel lines and stuff like that. Um, on a set design point of view, of course, you would have a more messy set, but uh, these are the things that just uh, also 
contribute to the fact of this shot not working. Uh, here was some, uh, for example, a paint over that Tiartan did uh, um, just on uh, a set dressing point of view. We wanted to make it more dirty, of course, and uh, we wanted to ma make sure that it kind of feels like a neglected place. Um, uh, here is uh, some layout tests um, for the arrangement of picture frames. I think that was me just trying to duplicate things and see what shapes work and what don't. Um, this was the <laughs> result of that, which was like, okay, um, I think that idea just came from Ton, and he suggested to just make the place so full that your eye just gets, uh, uh, gets uh, you know, you're, you get the attention to the place that is uh, kind of empty where the character is. And uh, yeah, that kind of worked. Uh, this is the final shot. And uh, of course, we had to do some things with lighting also and, and, and color grading uh, to make that work. But uh, yeah, this is an example of how we, we use too much visual information to produce these empty spaces that your eye can kind of rest onto. That's another example here. Um, uh, but of course, the thing that is also instrumental to making this work is the, the lighting and uh, kind of the focus point of the whole shot. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, we had to, <laughs> we had this very early version of this shot where the agent is sitting down on the, uh, on the dressing table and he gets his haircut. And uh, the, the early versions of this, I mean, we knew that some things were not, I mean, most of the things were not done, but, but still, like, the composition is kind of really strange and there are some, there's lots of things that, that just drag too much attention, like the, the glossy uh, uh, containers on the table. And uh, here's some paint overs that we did. I think the, uh, the, the one side is from Jartan and the other one is from me. And we just try to find some things that we can do to, to focus our eye better on, on the action that is going on on the screen. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of worked. It's mostly, it's a, it's a mixture of trying to find, um, uh, trying to find these um, areas of contrast that you produce on the screen and trying to balance them with uh, where your eye needs to go. Uh, for example, um, there was this problem that the, the texture on the drawers were just, was just too contrasty and uh, the, the tables were too bright and the mirrors were too clean. So uh, what we uh, ended up doing also is to kind of tint the mirrored reflection so we don't have uh, you know, a, clear, uh, a clear vision into the space, uh, into the reflected space beneath them. Um, <clears throat> and also we kind of tried to dial down uh, the reflective areas. So uh, yeah, I think this is oh, yeah, <laughs> this is uh, another example of how we try to uh, deal with the focal depth, because um, I think that's one thing that uh, Colin had a very strong uh, well op opinion about. Because I mean, he knows about uh, about uh, actual real filmmaking, and 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 in, in the real world. So um, we try to find uh, the the right lens values that work for this without making it too. Uh, blurry. So I think this is uh, as at f uh, 2.8. Uh, this is um, this is at f2. So we're trying to make the depth more shallow, and uh, we're trying to find you know the right focus point where we can uh, where, where we can track the camera's attention. This is at 1.4, um, and this is at 0.7. So I'm not sure if it's, yeah, it's uh, pretty clear here on the screen that it's kind of too blurry. So we ended up at 1.4 uh, in the end of the shot. And which makes sense. I mean, you would, uh, you would have a film camera in that space and it would kind of be a, a, a low light situation. So you might have to uh, put those f-stops down. Uh, this is the final version of the shot. And uh, of course, um, I mean, it was a combination of just uh, the lighting, the textures, the set dressing, and uh, but also the color grading. I think uh, Colin and uh, Sean Wells, the, the grader, did a great job at you know making sure that we just look at the characters here and that nothing else gets uh, gets too much attention. Uh, <laughs> here is a kind of obvious one, but it makes sense on. Um, as a design choice when you're just working on props. But uh, uh, yeah, you 
shouldn't make things too glossy or too bumpy. Um, and those were the main culprits of that. Uh, we were tr just trying early on really uh, to, f to figure out the style and we were ending up uh, copying things too much from the real world. So uh, things were too kind of realistic, hashtag PBR. Uh, but uh, w we tried to dial that down later on. So for example, here uh, again in this shot, we try to uh, lower the bump uh, and the specular of the, the drawer um, of the cash register in the foreground. Um, you can see that here. Uh, and uh, we try to separate the specularity from the diffuse, um, from the diffuse lighting. So that means that we had some lights that were purely diffuse and some lights that were purely specular. Um, for, to get all this stuff to work, we had to you know, create a huge array of light. Uh, none of these shots is actually lit realistically from the, the window coming into the inside and kind of filling the space. We just had to fill everything with lots of huge area lights, uh, kind of like you would light a movie set. Um, <clears throat> here is a, a more clearer example. Um, there, there was this painting that the agent is turning around, and we were we could never f quite figure out what, uh, why, why it wasn't working. So I think uh, Colin and Kirtan they just uh, suggested to uh, remove the bump, making it less complex, and then just reducing the complexity in that in that painting, uh, and making it bigger. Um, another thing that is uh, just on on a pure artistic point of view, uh, really important is to uh, to simplify colors overall when you're lighting something, um, I think the the thing the point where I really uh, where I really understood that is when when Hjartan made all these great paint overs of uh, of the real of the comic books because we looked out at these comic book pages that we we're trying to emulate and uh, I mean there are comics and we are making a film but still what what kind of ideas can we take from the color uh, the, the the color scheme uh, to, uh, uh, into, into our interpretation. And uh, the colors in the comic books are, are, kind of, are really beautiful because also the paper and the, 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 the medium it's printed on kind of affects it. Um, this is, for example, a paint over that Hjartan did for the interior spaces, uh, kind of just uh, filling the colors and then adding some subtle shading and kind of lighting it uh, semi-realistically. But uh, it gives you a really clear idea of how, like, how this palette is kind of limited. You shouldn't just make it, you know, add all kinds of colors in there, red, green, and blue, or so it wouldn't work. <clears throat> so uh, here's an example of, uh, of a shot in a movie that uh, Pablo lit. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we needed to have a clear understanding to where the light actually comes from. So um, we needed to have a clear separation of outdoor light and interior light because there was this big window that was uh, casting this big, you know, it was the, actually the, the main light source because there was this bright light coming from, from the outdoor. Um, and we were trying to balance that with the interior light because um, the, the interior light, of course, is very useful because you can kind of highlight the characters in a better way. Um, most of the action was actually happening from the direction of that window. So if we lit it realistically, it would look really flat and, uh, and, and not really nice. So uh, using these interior lights uh, meant that we had to separate the colors from the exterior to make sure that we still kind of know uh, where in visual space we are. Um, so we went for the kind of obvious thing. So let's call, color the exterior light blue. Let's color the interior light yellow. It kind of works. Um, here's, a, here's an example. Of course, uh, the, the big challenge was also to make it not look too artificial. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be really tough with the, with the next project to kind of make sure that this, this uh, natural likes, light still kind of feels natural and not like you put, a, put an aquarium in there or so. <clears throat> uh, uh, here's a good one. Uh, sculpting with light to clarify form and readability, which um, it's not really obvious, but it, it makes like it makes total sense if you're trying to you know make characters look appealing because you want to make sure that that you can as a viewer identify uh, how they you know how they are constructed anat anatomically, and uh, again. Uh, Beautiful paint over from Hjartan, where he um, 
he, I think his idea was because uh, cars are so important in Martin's universe, he wanted to paint over some cars. Um, uh, but I, what I really liked with this is that um, that the surface uh, that that is in Ma Martin's drawings, it's very uh, it's, it makes sense from, uh, fr from a perspective point of view. I mean, it's, it's stylized and uh, uh, it's an inter artistic interpretation of, uh, of um, you know, perspective, but still it kind of has a shape and a form. And I think what Carton's paint over shows is that, that shading it really nicely kind of helps also making it more appealing. And that was also one of the things that really worked with this shot. And I think if we just dissected it, um, the, the, the characters are, are lit uh, in a way that makes them appealing. Um, also, these ones here uh, were very early examples that kind of just worked. And uh, it's, it has to do with you know, finding the right position for the lights. And that's, that's just a lot of trial and error. Um, that was an, a really early example, and that ties into what I just explained with the window. So this was how it would look like if we lit it from the window. And there was this huge like uh, white balance and all that kind of stuff, so the exterior light kind of uh, is really bright, so we want to white balance for that, so it's kind of white. Um, <laughs> you're lighting everything with this huge white light from, from your point of view, and that makes everything look horrible. Um, so in a little uh, lighting session with Colin, we uh, kind of tried to Push, push the light around uh, kind of like a, a, a movie DP or uh, and a director would do to kind of make sure to cheat it, but still make it believable. Um, of course, there's other issues here where the background is too, details and we get, uh, too detailed and we get too much uh, attention on the background. So um, in, in the final movie, we kind of try to approach it more uh, film noir-ish, where, uh, where we really put some spotlights uh, on the characters and just try to you know, carve them out of this, uh, of this room to make sure that your attention is completely focused on them. Um, uh, here's also a good one uh, that was, uh, I was constantly, I think at this point, uh, Colin was uh, in, a, uh, in the States for a short trip, so he's, he was sending me all these notes. Um, and I was lighting this whole sequence, and uh, one of his notes was, I mean, this wasn't almost, this wasn't his notes, I made that up, but uh, his note was basically that we can't figure out the, the planes of, you know, the, the sculptural planes in this thing. There's too many uh, flat colors all, all over the place, and we can't really separate uh, the agent's hands from the table. So if you kind of squint, you, you don't really know what is going on here. So uh, as a resulting, step, we kind of darkened down the, I mean, everything basically, and just uh, uh, went back to this kind of spotlight situation. And uh, of course, we darkened down the texture of the dressing table. And I think uh, we also tweaked the, the specularity of the gun to kind of uh, make it more, you know, fit into that space. Uh, another example, uh, this was the first iteration of, or first or second iteration of the lighting of that shot. And this was the final one, and uh, you can see that you know we can we get a much better sense of the shape of the faces and everything, <clears throat> and also of the drama. And uh, again, the, the 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 color grading really helps to kind of uh, this is the final graded shot. So the color grading uh, did like added just uh, a bit more on top of the existing lighting. <clears throat> um, then the final thing that I learned is, uh, is really just a pr pragmatic one when you're working on something. Um, working on the big picture is, is always better than just focusing on that small entity of a shot that you're working on. Uh, I think it's really, <laughs> it's really important to try as many things as you can on a wide variety of things and just fail, fail all over the place. <laughs> it doesn't matter because uh, the, the sooner you fail, the, 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 the sooner you can make it better, right? And uh, yeah, hopefully <laughs> we failed enough and uh, we can make it more awesome next time. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Wow, this is great art. Um, I'm going to take, um, I don't want to take uh, all the credit for what I'm going to show now. 
I will actually give proper credit. And you know, this artistic process, this iteration is so fascinating to witness when you're in the studio working uh, day, day by day and see all the struggles and see everything come together. But then really, <laughs> that's what everybody wants to know. That's why you're all here. <laughs> Or at least that's what usually happens after you know showing the movie and everything. Like one of the first questions comes out: oh, How did you guys do it? How? And and so really, like you know, uh, we've been uh, uh, we've been. Uh, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, a few things: um, our uh, overall uh, pipeline and um, uh, the biggest rendering challenges and. Uh, um, Flamenco, our render management software, and Attract, our production management software. Um, and just uh, give you a bit of an overview of uh, how much we developed, what, what changed uh, since uh, you know, we, we, we bring this topic up uh, almost every, every year to show our progress, and the agent really helped to uh, move things uh, forward. Uh, but really, how long did this take to render? Um, so i just show you some, you know, it's a random graph, just to give you the illusion that I'm going to tell you how long it took to render. Um, the movie is uh, uh, 5,555 frames, so it's an easy number, so I remember it. And uh, with that, you can do some math. Uh, but uh, so, you know, in some, some cases, uh, it took up to 100 hours per frame to render. I'm not talking about final frames, because you know, before you get to the final render time, you have to iterate a few times. In some cases, it might even get up to 400 hours. We didn't actually waste 400 hours of computing because we want to save the planet. So we render at a smaller resolution, but then you can extrapolate and you can go like, okay, this actually might take 400 hours, so maybe we should fix this. And um, in terms of memory, the, uh, the shots were not really uh, too complex uh, compared to, for example, Cosmos Laundromat, where we had to deal with uh, uh, caches and particles uh, to a whole different level. So we are talking about like 20, 30 gigabytes of RAM. Um, but really, in, uh, in the end, after these 100 hours of projected computing time, we actually managed to uh, bring it down to an average of 8 to 10 uh, hours per frame, which is uh, not too shabby, actually. And um, I have to give a special thanks to uh, IT for Innovation, uh, which is a, a supercomputing center in the Czech Republic that uh, provided us with a lot of uh, uh, render power. Um, we did uh, a lot of rendering on our end to make sure that everything was ready to go for a final over there, where uh, we had a supercomputing availability to actually make these uh, uh, hundreds of frames uh, render. And uh, just to give you a measure of what kind of computers we are talking about uh, is, uh, you know, uh, Intel Z on uh, 24 cores, so it's like dual core uh, uh, machines, uh, dual uh, CPU uh, machines with uh, you know 100 gigs of RAM and uh, and uh, uh, yeah 24 cores. So it's like not really you know they have a lot of memory, but in our case our machines didn't have that much, so we needed to make sure that it would fit, and uh, so that was never uh, a problem. And the, and the computers themselves, they were, you know, uh, industry standard, but uh, uh, nothing incredible. What was the hardest shot of the movie? That's also something uh, that people want to know. Like your worst nightmare, the one that kept you awake at night. And um, it was uh, 11-1A. <laughs> so... I hate it. 11-1A um, was a very difficult shot. Who knows what 11-1A is? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the studio people know, but okay. I actually had to look it up because it's already fading away, but then you read it and you're like, okay, yes. 11-1A um, um, is this shot. So this shot is very important because it was uh, one of the first shots uh, that uh, we started experimenting with uh, when uh, uh, doing motion blur tests. And um, basically, uh, we found out something that, I mean, it was already known, which is uh, uh, motion blur and hair is kind of problematic. And um, we didn't really know the level of problematicness, but uh, 
basically what we did was like, okay, it takes, in, in some cases, some, some frames of this shot would take, uh, you know, factor 10, 20, factor 100, like, you know, uh, uh, the time of, of the average for rendering the shot. So instead of rendering in uh, one hour or in 10 hours, it would actually render in 100 hours, just one frame. Why? So of course, uh, to to get before going to Sergey complaining uh, that uh, cycles doesn't work, we had to do a little bit of homework and uh, at least try to render things. So then I made this uh, very um, uh, simple, you know, overlay of plotting different kind of computers. Uh, rendering the frames with the render time for each frame. And you could actually then pinpoint exactly which frame was, uh, uh, was causing issues. And uh, that's when then Sergey got to work. And <laughs> and he turbocharged cycles and uh, did some magic to even out these render times. So here's like the science. <laughs> um, so we wrote a little article about this. Probably some of you have seen, some of you have probably seen already that, that picture of Sergey coding really fast. And uh, it's actually, it was a quite, a quite popular uh, article because it was shared uh, also outside of the Blender circles. Maybe it was because of the uh, clickbaity title, how we made cycles 10 times faster, which actually was kind of true in some in instances. Um, so the technical explanation of this is, uh, of course, explained there. We wish we actually could document this uh, uh, better. But uh, as you can see, the idea is to, um, uh, you know, to tackle those specific cases when uh, you have a uh, hair and motion blur and uh, compute it in a more efficient way. Uh, so that you have a more predictable render time, because that's what we try to do. We, we, render, a, we render a frame from a sequence and we try to get an idea, okay, this shot is going to take more or less this amount of hours, that's okay, let's continue, uh, and render the rest of the sequence, and based on that, project how long it's going to take. So this is uh, one of the many uh, rendering challenges we had to face. We don't have a lot of time to dive into all the others. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about how we... Um, fit this into our um, open movie pipeline. So these cycles improvements, of course, were instrumental for rendering the movie. And uh, we rendered the movie using uh, Flamenco. Before we start, uh, I would like to give uh, uh, big props and credits to Sibran and uh, to Sergey, of course, who helped, and Pablo, who did uh, a lot of uh, UX uh, design for, uh, for the web tools, and uh, Dalai and uh, Bastien, who all teamed up to give us uh, help from any direction, uh, be it from scripting side, asset management side, uh, uh, you know, web development. A lot of work to make these tools uh, come together. So. Here is our uh, a little overview of how our Flamenco system works, which uh, should be no news, but just a little recap for those who have never heard of this thing before. Um, we are running it on the Blender Cloud. Uh, we are running a component which is called uh, the uh, Flamenco server, which is connected with the rest of the Blender Cloud infrastructure and is accessible via the web browser and uh, also via Blender directly. And uh, the server itself then is connected to different um, Flamenco managers. And the Flamenco managers are the ones that are actually in charge of uh, sending the actual data uh, down to the nodes which are doing the computing. And uh, this, uh, uh, this design allows for different managers to exist. So we could have our own uh, little manager in the uh, studio, and then we could have a manager somewhere else. And uh, in the future, uh, at the time that was the future, now it's the present, uh, this allows people to actually have their own render manager uh, outside of the Blender Cloud infrastructure. So they can control their own assets, they can control their own workers, and then just use the Blender Cloud server for uh, having a nice interface and a nice way to dispatch their jobs. But then the actual computing and asset management happens uh, on the um, uh, own, on, on your own side. Um, so one, one uh, interesting development that we did was uh, um, progressive rendering. This is a little overview of how progressive rendering works. Basically, we wanted 
the, the, the biggest challenge, the, the, the most important target when working on a, uh, on a shot and getting it to render is to get it back as soon as possible, getting uh, as quickly as possible an idea if we are going to fail or not. Because failing Im immediately is the most important thing. As Andy <laughs> was just explaining, it's valid all over, across the board. And um, the idea is to render iteratively a uh, low number of samples for every uh, frame. And, uh, and then uh, iterate over them. So you can review them, and then there is another iteration. So we render, for example, the shot has 300 samples, so we, we render 10 samples for every frame. We look at it, and then we can say, OK, uh, continue rendering. So then we render another 10 or 100 samples, and then we can sample merge them together. And, uh, and then that gives you uh, 110 or 150 or whatever many samples you want in the end. And uh, this is also very useful when you get to the end of the project and you have the deadline of Doom that is uh, uh, over you, and you go like, okay, we really wanted to render this with a thousand samples, but is it really going to work? So we can render it at 500, and it doesn't look too bad, and then if there is time, we can render another 500 samples. That gives you an amount of flexibility, which is fantastic, because in some cases, like this thing of rendering with a high number of samples is more like placebo than reality, because uh, you have this shot that is like 100 frames long in the middle of an action sequence, and even if it has a little bit of noise, nobody's actually going to notice. And that's why it's very important to work looking at the sequence, because it really informs where like, you really spot the mistakes, because when you really get to the point of finalizing the last frames before the day before sending everything to the final grade, you really need to spend your time wisely. So trying to always keep uh, have a step back and have an overview is very, very useful. And talking about having an overview of what is happening, um, let's talk a bit about the track. I have this uh, little video um, that uh, shows some uh, of uh, the things we did. With it, that of course, a big props to Sibran, who basically took care of uh, everything to <laughs> make this work. And it was uh, extremely, extremely helpful, especially in the final part of the film. Um, I have been, uh, you know, f following the project for uh, a while while it was happening. It took almost one year, but then it was especially in the last few months that I was really on board helping out to set uh, shots and, and to check them and to send them to the farm, make sure, uh, iterating together with uh, everyone in the team to make sure that everything that was rendered was actually uh, good to go. And um, we had this uh, fantastic integration of uh, Attract within the Blender video sequencer, so we were able to select shots and uh, change their status and uh, update their status on uh, a server. So then with a the web browser, you could actually go and see the entire shot list and see what every task uh, was looking like. So you could have layout, animation, lighting, effects, and you would know exactly what was going on uh, in, every, uh, in every stage. And we would have some sort of logging to also keep track of who was changing the status, if people were adding notes. We even had an SVN hook, which would allow us to commit something and mention a task and, uh, and say, ah, this task is done. So then in the, when, when browsing it from the, from the website, you would actually be able to see that things were actually uh, what happened there, basically. Because when you get a problem, you want to start tracing it back. The first place where you go is uh, a track to see, OK, did someone write anything about this? Is it broken? Who touched it last time? And so on. So having that information in an easy to access platform, that was very important. And uh, we actually did it during this movie. Uh, next up, we have BAM, which is the Blender Asset Manager, which is also the best kept or ignored Blender asset management secret in the entire Blender ecosystem. And uh, the reason why I'm saying this is uh, uh, because sometimes I, uh, I, I talk to uh, TDs uh, or uh, companies that are looking into Blender or that want to provide services uh, revolving around Blender. Very often, it's uh, uh, rendering services. And uh, everybody uh, has to deal with this problem. No? Uh, everyone here, probably, who has dealt with more than three blend files at some point had to deal with this problem. I want to move my three blend files from A to B, and, uh, and I want to be able to open them and have everything working. And that's what the BAM is for. We've been talking about this uh, many, many times, but I thought that I would dedicate a spe special slide just to explain how to use it. Um, basically, BAM is a, a package that you can install with the pip3 install blender BAM command, and then you can run it. And that's it. 
you don't need to implement your own uh, Blender asset management system. A lot of people go like, yeah, we have our special requirements, we have uh, you know, our render farm, we need to pack the Blend file, and we made our own brilliant solution, and then uh, you know, that way we can send the files. That's, of course, fantastic. But please, have a look at this, because it uh, saves so much time, and if you have uh, more development efforts towards this one package, uh, that's, very, uh, that's very good. One of the reasons why this is actually an external tool from Blender is because you don't really need Blender to take care of uh, what is linked into it. And it's also very useful because it doesn't all, isn't, we are not always talking about blend files. We are also talking about images sometimes. We are always talking about uh, movie files or uh, uh, external textures or something like that. So you really want to have something that is outside of Blender that takes care of all these things. All this is now available in the cloud for everybody, which is uh, uh, fantastic because uh, designing something for your own pipeline is uh, already a struggle to make things work, to make things on time for the film, and uh, to really do your own custom development. And that's the first iteration. It's really good. But um, making something that everyone can use, like with the more generic mindset, that's, uh, that's a big challenge. And I'm really uh, happy with the, uh, I really want to thank Sibran and Pablo, especially for the work they did uh, on, the, on the Blender Cloud platform for making this, uh, for making this possible. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it on my side. If you have any more questions, uh, we are always around and we are happy to talk about this. I give it up to Ton now. Ah, thank you guys. So there was also a reason why we did it, huh? apart from that's really fun and cool and awesome to make movies. Uh, the plan was to uh, make an animation test. Huh? That's how it all started. Uh, Kelty uh, presented a pitch and said, oh, let's try to find out what is this universe of the agent and especially how can we uh, transform the comics from the 70s, 80s, the, the touch comic, into a modern looking 3D animation film and try to sell it. Because that was, of course, the main goal, to have a feature film in development in our studio in Amsterdam. So aside of having a team working on the teaser, animation, test, whatever you call it, we also had people working on a story. At first we had a Dutch writer co uh, combining him with Colin. Uh, he produced a, a synopsis and together with the barbershop uh, we took the synopsis to the market and we tried to find out the interest from everybody. Unanimously everybody loves the barbershop uh, at, at every level in the film industry. They really see how fresh and how unique it is. It is really something that stands out. Right? This is not the, the average copy of another kid's film that everybody is trying. This is fresh, this is new, and it has a potential. But the, the response we had for the story we had in development was quite low. It was not really interesting. We were not even enthusiastic ourselves a lot. And uh, it was still very early in development. So I was very happy that uh, during all these uh, uh, connections I was having, that I also found two guys who were very, very much happy and available uh, to work with us. This is uh, <laughs> the Wilbert and Dave. Uh, Wilbert is Dutch, but he already lives in uh, Los Angeles for, for 25 years. He went to uh, uh, Hollywood to start working on the Iron Giant, and since then he worked for Blue Sky, for DreamWorks, and he ended up for Illumination, was head of story on movies like Despicable Me and all the other stuff. In the Netherlands, Wilbert is well known for his superior quality of uh, writing and story development. And he happens to know Martin Lodewijk, uh, the writer of the comics, really well. So Martin already introduced me to Wilbert. He said, why don't you talk to him, because maybe they can help. So I met them in Los Angeles. He introduced me to Dave, who was working for a lot of studios as 
uh, the person who comes in as last to rescue the whole story, right? A bit, uh, you always make a mess. That's how it goes in every project, even the, the big studios. They always have problems. And then you get in Dave, and he will start working on it and try to solve things. So together, they worked for three weeks on a complete new story. And I went four weeks ago to Los Angeles uh, to work with them further. Uh, they gave a pitch, uh, that's the picture of the pitch of the new thing. It was hilarious, three hours of storytelling, seeing uh, two people, two persons who are so incredibly uh, uh, experienced and versed in this whole story thing. So what we have now is, I don't know if there's the title in the next slide. Oh, no. So the, uh, the name of the movie we are working on currently is the... Uh, Einstein Enigma, that is the, the story. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the story is yet. We're still on, in development, but it's still the agent. It still plays in the 70s. Uh, it still has Olga in it, the Swiss secret agent. Uh, but the story is now much more personal. It's really about a person who gets into troubles because of his own personality in a way that you can really align with it. Plus, it is really exciting with lots of stuff that justifies an animation movie. So that's the, the status of the story. So we have a good story now. It uh, can be developed into a script. We have a fantastic teaser animation. And then we want to do some business. So what's the, 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 the goal? Right? We want to grow the Blender Institute. Uh, that's, uh, we can do many things. Uh, I can... I know I can do many things, but what I really like and what my passion is, is in making things. And apart from making Blender, I'm also very passionate about making media content. Uh, mostly animation film is just the best thing ever. And so the, for Blender's future, uh, if we want to keep growing, if we want to make Blender uh, more complete and a better, more professional product. I think it's a very good future if we would be able to grow the Blender Institute in an animation film studio with 40, 50 people, of which like uh, 10 or uh, more uh, engineers or software developers working on Blender, working on an open source pipeline for creation, uh, which will be shared with other studios and do some business with making commercial movies. But that's what I'm working on, and that's what we are pitching. Uh, we have three strategies for this. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the, uh, the ancient comics is considered to be our cultural heritage. Uh, this, uh, everybody older than 45, uh, 55 my age, they all know it. And those are the people who are sitting on the pots of money here. They're doing the, the subsidies. Uh, this is just very commercial thinking of me. But it's in it works, because I know where the Dutch Film Fund and others, there is no doubt about that we deserve the support uh, to make this film. What I'm still hoping is that there is some uh, wealthy internet millionaire out there who really grew up with the comics too, and who sees this video and thinks, oh my god, I really want to fund it. So this you never know, it could happen or it couldn't happen. The second strategy is, of course, how well can you find the money for film? Well, not in the Netherlands, right? If you get two, three million for a movie in Holland, then you have a big film. In Hollywood, that would not be, that's, a, that's one episode of a TV series, maybe. But you, in Hollywood, animation production go easily into the 100 or 150 million. We don't need that much. But if we want to make the agent a decent movie for the international market, uh, our budget is around uh, 12 to 15 million euros. That's what we think of, uh, what we need. And the only place in the world where they know how to make money with movies is Hollywood. Uh, we also, thanks to the Blender Project, have nice connections now. So I've been introduced to to all kinds of interesting people with very interesting lunches in Beverly Hills places. And, uh, <laughs> I can talk to you about that in private, but <laughs> we, uh, we have, uh, like for example, we now have an agent, uh, a, an agent for the agent movie. But if you are in Hollywood, you need an agent. You need somebody to represent you, right? And that's those people in those really big buildings with, with uh, uh, people with elevators without buttons for example, so they send you to an elevator and that automatically takes you to the floor where you can talk to a person. 
uh, it's a crazy stuff. But we have an agent, so I gave a pitch, and he said, okay, we're going to represent you. And somebody else said, yeah, but you also need a lawyer. So here is my lawyer, you can get this lawyer. This is a guy who's working for Luc Besson, for example. And he also says, yeah, this is great stuff. So if you are going to in, into negotiations in Hollywood, uh, we will help you with that. So that's, that's super important. This is the stuff that uh, gives us credibility. But of course, that takes time, and that takes time. And we, we are sending out all the stuff we have. We send out a new story. Uh, we luckily have a fantastic open movie book that's now over there. So we are still feeding them and uh, trying to find out if something is coming back. And the last strategy, which is probably more feasible, is working in a European co-production. I don't know if people, uh, uh, some people here are filmmakers. Uh, Europe uh, is divided in all kinds of nice little countries. Every country has a little bit of money. Uh, what is quite common in Europe is to combine the funds, uh, the public funding, especially from three or four countries, uh, put it all together, and then work with three or four different producers or even studios to work on a film and finish it. So I'm talking to several of those studios in Europe, in Belgium and in Germany, for example, to, to see if we can work on it together. This is all going on, and I will keep doing this for a while, and uh, I hope to have a great announcement one day. But currently, it's only the title of the feature film. Thank you, guys. And of course, everybody knows that we have a new film in development called Spring. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> and this time we have him as director. <laughs> so if you go to uh, cloud.blender.org, you can Last find all this stuff. And we have to cut because it's yeah. late. Hey, thank you.